So I want to talk to you a little bit about wellness. Um, and the reason I got involved in wellness and self-care, and I want to change the words. I mean, everybody hates it. It's like wellness, ew, you know, woohoo. Self-care, ew. I mean, if you, it's, it's kind of become kind of a, oh, whatever. It's that woohoo talk thing. But the reason I got involved in this and the reason I got interested in this is I was the poster child for burnout um, from 2012 to 2014. I hit a 100% wall. My husband finally sat me down and said, I love you. And if you do not figure out some way to take control of this job instead of this job taking control of you, I'm really worried about you. And thank goodness for that. Thank goodness for someone who loved me deeply and saw me melting down and said, we've got to do something about this. The reality is we're all very good at hiding it. We are, every single person in this room is resilient by nature. You are resilient by nature because you went to a gajillion years of school to do what you're doing. You took on a job that is about as high stress as you can get. There are a lot of high stress jobs out there, people that manage hedge funds, people that, that are in the military. I mean, there's a lot of high stress jobs out there, but very few of them where people's lives are literally in your hands. Um, if you screw up, things can go south. You're asked to do a million things in a very short amount of time. You're asked to do them all completely perfectly, document them perfectly, do everything medically legally perfectly. You, you are asked to do a tremendous amount. And most of us do fine with that, but not all of us. And I will tell you, I am highly concerned about the mental health of our colleagues in the world, but in this country, um, after this last year and a half. So what I want to do is spend time doing some of the woohoo talk, but it isn't all just woohoo talk. This is health. This is your health. This is taking control of your health. This is prioritizing your health. So let's talk about this, because the reality is this is, this is a cartoon that basically says, shows, shows the physician there sort of burning up in a chair, and the patient you know, saying, you know, what seems to be your problem, Mrs. Johnson? And the patient says, I, I feel the way you look. Now, this is a cartoon from 2012. This is a cartoon that was written, that was drawn up in 2012. And in 2018, 2017, 2018, the idea of physician burnout, and this was what got studied, this is what's been out there, but reality is it's healthcare worker burnout without any question. It had, it, these, were the, these were the headlines, it's epidemic proportions, and it really had, it really had. In fact, emergency medicine was the poster child for this. Emergency medicine had more than half of the emergency physicians, they, again, it was the polls that were done and the studies that were done on physicians initially. Physicians were basically calling themselves burned out and around that time anywhere between 60 and 70 percent of emergency medicine residents considered themselves burned out now this actually trickled through all specialties in medicine this wasn't just emergency medicine but physician burnout became a really big deal and then as this was all hitting the fan and people were trying to figure out what if anything could be done about this and how this happened and it got dumped right on top of a healthcare population healthcare provider population that already was really kind of hitting a wall and one of the things I want to sort of throw out to you is the concept of what you've all lived through the, through the last year and a half isn't just stress in your job, isn't just political division, isn't just people not believing it's even real when you spend every day taking care of it, but it also led for, a, for each human being that had to deal with this, it led to the, the stages of grief. One of the things to factor in to how you feel right now is the understanding that you are going through all of the stages of grief. We all are, everyone in this country is. This isn't just because if you knew somebody who died, this isn't just if you got sick, this is actually our lives as we knew them are not the same, nor will they actually ever be and perhaps for the good, who knows? But we went through all of these stages from anything from you know, a killer virus really, but it, it won't really come to the US, will it? Well, I'm not gonna wear a mask, it's just I refuse to deal with this. Or, well, they'll find a cure, I'll just wait, they'll find a cure for this. Or, okay, well, it's never going away, that's it. Or, it's never going away. Or, well, maybe if I wear a mask, I might be able to go to Vegas. If I get a vaccine, maybe I can go take a class in Vegas and go to a conference again, and maybe this, is it? Maybe this is the new normal. And you may be anywhere in this spectrum right now. And you may be one day great and one day not so great. This is layered on top of the reality that in, um, in medicine and in emergency medicine in particular, burnout is a real 100% deal. Absolutely 100% real. This is a term that came out of an editorial that was written about how we all have been feeling over this last year and a half. And I love this term. 
when, when we basically shut down, a lot of us were in our homes just going to work and back to, to our homes, and that was it. You know, maybe running to the grocery store with, you know, like in, wrapped in plastic so you felt safe. You know, th this, is, this idea is what we did is we languished. And the term languish means that you're not thriving, and you're also not totally depressed. You're just languishing. You're just kind of there. You're not really doing much of anything. And that is something that I think was a, a state that a lot of people were in. It's almost like putting a hold button on a feeling of discontent, a feeling of dysphoria. It's like a putting a, a sort of a hold button on that. That's what we all kind of have lived through. And I think acknowledging that is 90% of the ball game. That's really important to do. Because I want to step back a little bit into this burnout idea. So if you think about burnout, one of the, if I said, so this is from a survey, by the way, Medscape, the th one of the things that Martha referred to on her apps, things you can kind of go to, Medscape does a survey, they actually did it in a longer time period, they're doing it shorter and shorter time periods, on burnout in physicians, and I believe they've now extended this to all healthcare workers, but I know they have physician data. And what they did is they sat this survey of physicians down, they basically sent out the thing and said, here are a list of things that might cause burnout, and write in anything that's your problem and see what's there. Why, why are you burned out? And if you look at this list, just glance at it, it's stuff you all agree with. All this this excuse me, but BS, I, we're recording this, or I would be much more graphic. The stuff that we have to do in our charting is crazy. It's crazy stuff. It's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with healthcare. Zero to do with healthcare. We practice defensive medicine because we don't want to get sued or we got sued and now we're feeling you know, defensive about it. There's lots of things. I'm a cog in the wheel. I'm just a, a shift holder. I just I put my name on the shift and I'm just the person holding that place. There's a lot of things that we listed here that are 100% important in why we feel fried in what we do. It's a, it's a, I'm gonna and I'm going to tell you at the end some of, some of the things that have helped me in the end, but just this is, this is some of the stuff that every day we deal with. And acknowledging it is key because this is what happens. So think about it. One of the things that happens in our job in particular is a concept called vicarious trauma. What this means, so the best example I can think of that most people would relate to is that say you have a loved one who just died, died and the next person you see in the emergency department is a person that same age having that same condition. And you are going to have a very physiologic response to taking care of that person because you just experienced it. Or say you resuscitate or are unable to resuscitate a, a child who has, let's say, a drowning. But you have that age child at home. You, it, is, it is a natural human response to vicariously sort of translate all this stuff into how it affects your life too, or could affect your life. Or it is the empath it's the thing that makes you so special in what you do. It's the empathetic part of you taking in a little too much, a little too personally. And it's, it's vicarious trauma. We, and think about it, what we see in our jobs. It happens all the time. Eventually, you get a secondary traumatic kind of stress problem with this. And eventually, what you to, to protect yourself, you do with this thing called compassion fatigue. I'm just going to block it off. I'm going to go take care of you. I'm going to do a really good job taking care of you, but I'm not going to let the fact that you look like my father, you sound like my cousin, you look just like my best friend who just got killed in a car crash, I'm going to block that out. I'm just gonna not even register that. And I'm gonna basically just treat you like a walking disease, not a human being that has a condition. That's part of compassion fatigue. You get mad at people for coming into your emergency department. You know, how could, what are you doing here with pain again? What's up with that? You know, you're here with chest, it's three in the morning, I needed an hour of sleep, but I had a chance and now you're the person that's keeping me up. It's called compassion fatigue. It's a big problem. And then the thing, that, and this is all the cycle of burnout. And the only reason I'm emphasizing this is so that you can see it when it's happening to you. We'll talk about tools and tricks in a second. The thing that got added to this with COVID was moral injury. The idea that we might be asked, and some people were asked, to decide who gets the ventilator. Um, to know there might be treatments we have available, but oops, the only ECMO we have in the hospital is already being used on that person. This person doesn't get it. These are moral injuries that, for, especially for people that do the kinds of jobs that we do, are extraordinarily hard to reconcile. Extremely hard to reconcile. And the reason for, I'm not trying to drag your mood down, I'm trying to inform you so you understand the kinds of things that might be triggers for you that might really drive you into sort of an emotional pit. This is sort of the cycle of burnout. And one of the reasons I put this slide in here is these are just all early warning signs that either you may feel in yourself, and this, you can read, just, I can read it to you, but you can read just as well as I can. Better yet though, what I also think that is helpful, especially right now, is to keep an eye on your colleagues. 
If you see someone you know is usually super bouncy and wonderful in their job and they're just not, and they haven't been for a while, keep an eye on your colleagues. And all you have to do is say, are you okay? You know, I've known you a long time. You just don't seem, you seem a little off. Are you okay? And sometimes that is all it takes to kick open a door to have someone talk to you or talk to somebody before things go bad. Because this is what happens. In the United States, three to 400 physicians kill themselves every year. That doesn't sound like a lot of people, but think about that. That is a lot of lives that have been taken care of, a lot of families that are involved. And this has happened, this has been quite prominent during COVID. Um, and not just, it's nurses, it's doctors, it's all kinds of healthcare providers. Our job, if we can, is to be sensitive to our colleagues so that if you notice somebody's a little off or if you feel a little off, don't let it go far enough that you feel so whatever that you feel the world is better off without you. Um, don't let it go there. And I'll tell you, across the board, I think if you don't know someone who's committed suicide in healthcare, you've certainly read about them. And if you paid attention last May, you read the story of Lorna Breen, a very prominent emergency physician in New York City who got COVID, went out, came back, and ended up killing herself. And her family has basically started a fund, and they actually are looking, trying to get an act through Congress, to basically take the stigma away of seeking mental health care if you're a health care provider. We know there's a stigma just in life, which is dumb, but there's a stigma of going to, to seek mental health help, no matter who you are. But in healthcare, we've added this lovely extra layer that when you apply for credentialing at a hospital, you have to, have you ever had a mental health condition or sought care from a mental health professional? That, with that question is in there that has, that it is none of their business. Their goal in this bill is to get that question taken off. Now, it's not in every state every more anymore. Um, it's actually coming off slowly because of this push. You want a mentally well healthcare provider. And if they need to talk to somebody, that is, they're so what? If they need some medicines to help them for a while, so what? The key is to keep you healthy. So please, please pay attention to your own self and your colleagues and don't let it get to this point, which we know it happens un unfortunately more common than we would like it to. So when you talk about all these things, the stress and how you know, you're not resilient enough and you, it's, it's your fault, you're the one that's not coping, you know, it's you that's the problem. It is not you that is the problem, period. It is not. Let's go back to this list. This list, if you look at this list, there are so many things on this list that you don't have any control over, but your CEO might or your medical director might or the CMS might, that CMS that has all those stupid rules, or HHS might, or the federal government might, or your state medical board might, where they actually can have an impact. This is where you being active somehow, write a letter to your congressman, make a phone call, make a donation to something, where you can at least get something in there. The system is doing a lot of this. You are not, you are resilient beings. That's how you got to where you are. The system is doing this. So part of our tackling this is going to be to hold people's feet to the fire who can make a difference. It's time for a revolution. It's time to say you are out of your bloody minds to try to make us do this kind of stuff and deliver wonderful healthcare, which is the whole reason we went into this in the first place, is those people, not you people. Those patients were taken care of, not you people up there in these little places that are bean counting. So these things know that there is a, and I'll tell you, what was happening before COVID is that there was a finally a, 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 an understanding by some of the powers that be, including the feds, that some of these things they did have some control over. They actually did have some impact on the mental health of the healthcare providers who are providing healthcare to the country. So just know that, that it is not all on you. A lot of this is on systems that we can actually tackle. It's gonna be slow, it's glacial paces to change these things, but these things can change. They absolutely can change. So there is hope in that regard. The reality though is you do have to get through your life day to day. Okay, you have to figure out what you can do day to day to take care of yourself and to get through life. So what can you do? Now, I think of life, I think of all of our lives as this kind of pie chart. And basically, it's a balance of your body, your mind, and your spirit. And what you have in this whole mishmash of things is you're building this beautiful home that your life lives in, where you have your friends, and you have your family, and you have your work colleagues. You have this lovely, beautiful balance that is based on this foundation of you as an individual of a strong body, mind, and spirit. 
Now, we know the things that make your body strong, okay? We know that you need sleep, you need good nutrition and exercise. You know that. So I'm going to spend a teeny tiny bit of time with that, but you know that. I, I could tell you 12 ways from Sunday to exercise three times a week. I don't even do it regularly. So the, we all know that. That's like intellectually you know that. We all know that intellectual stimulation is a wonderful thing to help keep you fresh and keep you interested. But we also know it can fry you. So mind rest, basically mental rest is key. Whatever you need to do, take a walk, you know, whatever you need to do for mental rest, play a puzzle, do something, do nothing, do, just sit and do nothing, do a hobby, something that's mental rest, those are key. Again, that your mind needs space, your mind needs time. There's great research that says downtime, scheduled downtime. If you're working really hard and you take five minutes and you go walk outside, scheduled downtime, you're more productive when you come back. Great research that says this. Downtime is key. So your mind needs a balance as well. But your spirit is where we get crushed. It's your spirit where we get crushed. That's where a lot of this despondency comes from, is your spirit gets crushed. And there are lots of parts to you that are your spirit. When we get stressed, we basically give up on rest. So we all gave up on rest during COVID. Everybody's working crazy ships. We give, we give uh, you know, forget eating well. You have, if, if the backseat of your car is full of drive-through bags and cups and you just toss them in the back seat as you're driving to the next place you're going to work or your next shift check a look at what's in your back seat or on the floor of your car if it's full of fast food stuff you know you've gotten into that habit of just i need sustenance that's what i'm going to do that's not healthy and we know that exercise tends to go as well we tend to like i'm just too flipping tired to exercise i am too tired those go quickly and it turns out that in the foundation of you that helps you stay healthy, that keeps your house nice and beautifully built, is those three core things. Don't ignore them. I'll come back to that in a little while. The mental rest I mentioned, please factor it in. Find a way that you can get mental rest. But I want to spend a little time on your spirit because we, it's woohoo. People don't, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to talk about the spirit stuff. It is so important to keeping you healthy. So let's talk a little bit about it because as you get tired and as you're not rested and as your mind is going all the time, you lose things like your sense of, of gratitude. You lose your, your ability to love and feel joy and see beauty. You lose it. And it starts this cycle that becomes really potentially deadly. It becomes really... And, if nothing else, it takes the fun out of life. So you got to figure out a way to put it back in, figure out a way to do this. Because otherwise, this is what's happening to that beautiful house you built. The foundation is falling apart. The foundation will, is crumbling. The house still looks great from the front. It's not when you get underneath. So let's fix it. So when they did these surveys from Medscape and they said, okay, you as a, as a physician, let's just open it to all health healthcare practitioners because we're very similar in all of this. What do you do to cope with this idea of burnout? Now, most people exercise, which I think is great. I suspect this survey may have been a bunch of younger people. I'm not sure everybody exercises, but exercising was great. Talking to other people, reaching out to other people, like-minded people that just like, can I blow this by you because I'm so frustrated or I'm tired or can I tell you about this case that broke my heart? It's nice to be able to talk to somebody sleep. I found it very encouraging that practitioners had enough insight, clinicians had enough insight to know that if I'm really frying, I need more sleep. That was a very good insight. That's an excellent one. And music turns out to be magic. Music is magic. If you have Pandora or Spotify or playlists that you like, and you know if you hit that one, you're, but within two songs, you're going to be tapping your toes and walking. Use it. Use it. Music, is, if you are hyper and you know that classical music calms you down, or if you're feeling really depressed, but you know 1980s rock anthems always get you going, do it. It's, and, and physicians do it all the time. In this particular survey, it was for physicians. But here's what they also said they did. They isolated, they ate more junk food, they um, drank more alcohol, which I uh, think about what COVID did. We all had to isolate and, and alcohol sales went up by 50% the first three months of our isolation. We basically drank more and didn't talk to anybody. We sat around, people smoked more, they used drugs, they, oh, they used prescription drugs, they started using them for sleep, then they used them for everything. There are a lot of habits here that people knew were unhealthy and still said, this is what I do to cope. Our job really is to figure out ways to cope healthfully, that keep us as healthy as we can. So if we go back to this sort of foundation of our houses that we're building of our lives, sleep you cannot cut short. I will tell you, if you think that you can bank sleep, I'm going to just like three, get three hours of sleep for the, these four days, but then I'll just sleep for 12 hours over the weekend, both days, you can't bank it. Sleep research is fascinating. You cannot bank it. 
there's, there's a reason that teenagers, basically all they do is sleep and say whatever. You know, that's like their lives for like years of their lives. Their brains are, being, are basically getting plastically built in there. Sleep is important for them to cope with the huge things that happen when they change through puberty and get out in the world. Sleep is key, it's vital, and it's vital for you. So please try to get yourself, understand how to sleep well. Sleep hygiene is a whole separate thing we can talk about, but know your own sleep hygiene situation, get good sleep. Nutrition counts, exercise counts. We know that intellectual stimulation and all that's one thing, but I want to spend a little time on the woohoo stuff because the woohoo stuff turns out to be very helpful to building little building blocks of resilience in you. Now, mindfulness is a term that has been beaten to death. It is, all mindfulness is, is paying attention. Just erase, when it says mindful, erase it and put in paying attention. I'm paying attention to right now. That's all mindfulness is. I'm paying attention. So right now, my hands are a little sweaty because I'm up here talking in front of you. I'm a little bit cold. My fingers are cold. I'm a little bit cold up here, which is actually kind of good. I'm aware of the fact I'm talking too fast. Um, I know that. This is something I feel passionate about, though, so I'm good with that. I'm aware of the moment. I know who you all are. I see all of your faces. That light is making me crazy. That is living in the moment right now. That's what it is. All it is is paying attention to right now. And while I was doing that, I couldn't worry about tomorrow, and I couldn't regret yesterday. I was spending a lot of time just right now. That's all it is. That's all mindfulness is, is paying attention to right now. While you're paying attention to right now, you can't pay attention to the other stuff. It's amazingly simple, and it seems almost stupid, but it really is helpful on purpose paying attention to right now and not judging it. It's like, yeah, I'm cold, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm talking too fast. Well, okay, that's fine. Don't react to things. Just respond if you need to. Oh, I'm cold. I'm going to put on a sweater. Instead of, God damn it, why is it always so cold in this room? Two totally different reactions. One's reaction, one's response. You get a choice on how to do that. Really helpful. Because honestly, the, we have, COVID taught us nothing. If working in emergency medicine teaches you nothing, what we know is now is all you have. You don't know what's going to happen a second from now. I could drop dead of a V-fib arrest right now. Who knows? All I know is this is all I have. There is no amount of regretting that's going to change what went behind you, and there is no amount of worrying that's going to change what comes down the pike. Okay, it's just how you do things, how you respond, is what, that's what you have control over. Worrying doesn't basically change tomorrow of what may happen. It doesn't change tomorrow of the sorrow we know is coming down the pike no matter what. We all will have it. It is what it is. But worrying about the sorrow tomorrow is going to rob today of its joy. So these, these dictums, they sound dumb, but they're not. It's like the ultimate in wisdom. It's the ultimate in human wisdom. So it sounds wonderful, but I'm fried, I'm tired, I'm burnt out, I hate things, I'm mad at people all the time, I'm full of rage. How do I do that? How do I do that? Well, I will tell you, if you are a meditator, you are a leg up. There is phenomenal research on meditation out there. And if you meditate as short as three to five minutes a day, every day, you change your brain. You actually, on, on MRI scans, on functional MRI scans, you change your brain. But meditation doesn't have to be, oh, I'm going to just, ooh, woo, woo, yeah, it isn't. You can meditate lots of different ways. You could meditate walking back to your room. I'm putting my heel down and I'm walking. I'm putting my heel down and I'm walking. I'm ba and you just, that's, that's movement meditation. You can use beads. If, if you are somebody who prays the rosary, you are meditating. You're just doing it in a way that's a little more formulated, but you're meditating. You can focus on things. You can focus on these sort of things, or, the, or you can focus on a candle. You can do whatever you want. And actually, I will tell you, if you are not, it's like, ooh, I don't do that woohoo stuff, download either Headspace or Calm. So these two are free apps to you, and in fact, Headspace was made free to all healthcare workers across the country during COVID by the guy who founded it. These are little apps where they gives you, it, it gives you five minutes of meditation. What some of the residents have done where I work is they, on purpose, drive to work early, sit in their cars for 10 minutes, do this for 10 minutes in their car, go into work, come out, sit in their car for 10 minutes, do it again, and then go home. I have yet to have one of them tell me it didn't help them. So use this how you want to. These, again, this is totally up to you, totally up to you, but there's lots of different options out there for you that can make meditation easy and not so woohoo weird. You don't have to sit funny with your legs all crossed. I can't even do that anymore. You can sit anywhere you want to. You can stand up and do this. You can do it however you want to. So it, again, this, I'm a big fan of this, but it's up to you to decide. Just give it a go, though. These things are pretty cool. Now, there is one form of meditation that has been studied in healthcare workers in us 
that turns out to be very helpful even when they've done PET scan or um, MRI scans to look at our brains. And this is what's called loving kindness meditation. One of the things that's interesting about this is that if, it, so for instance, if you smile right now, if you smile, even if you don't believe anything is worth smiling about, if you smile right now, your brain says, oh, those muscles are moving. I must be happy. And it basically gives you a little bit of the, you know, a little dopamine charge there. Just the act of smiling. Turns out this kind of meditation is the same. And basically it gives you permission to say to yourself, may I be happy, may I be safe, may I be healthy, may I be at peace. And if you're really a good person and you want to give it a go, you walk through that casino and one by one in your brain, you say to each of those people sitting at the slot machines, may you be happy, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be at peace. It sounds woohoo, but I will tell you, there is great data that, that says a healthcare worker who can do this, who can keep this part of this loving kindness concept, this empathy concept, will be healthier themselves. Again, up to you, and I'm not going to beat that to, to a dead, I'm not going to beat that a dead horse. I just think it's worth it if you're, if you're willing to give it a try. Now, the other thing is to remember, you are feeding your mind every day. Every minute. Right now you're feeding your mind medical stuff or this woohoo stuff. But you get to feed your mind every day. You get to choose what goes in there. And remember, you can't unsee what you've seen. You can't unhear what you've heard. Once it's in there, it's in there. Whether you, whether you register it or not or can tap into it later or not is one thing. But it's all in there. So if you think about toxins, you're not going to go drink ethylene glycol. You're not going to put a toxin in your body. Well, the reality is you also put toxins in your brain. The news cycle is the most, it's the most malignant, pernicious thing out there right now. It has just become this terrible place no matter where you go. Turn it off. If you're somebody that gets 15 news dings a day, just turning those off is going to help your mental health. I guarantee it. News in itself that sells is bad. There's a reason that there's an, if there's an extra inch of space in a, in a newspaper, they don't put Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who wanted to have children for 15 years, finally conceived and are having a baby boy. No. They put people die in a car crash in Italy. Why would I want to know that? What good does that do me? So you choose what you put in your brain. Violent games, violent movies, those things get in your brain. You get plenty of violence at work. If you like these, that's fine. Just know what you, can't, what you see, you can't unsee. What you hear, you can't unhear. And there are, we all know people in our lives who are toxic. We know the people in our lives that are not good for us. We know who they are. Sometimes they're relatives and you can't get rid of them. Sometimes you can even if they're relatives. You get to choose who's in your life. So if there are people that you know bring you down, don't have them around or don't interact with them any more than you absolutely have to. Because the reality is everything you put in your mind and your body matters. Make choices that are thoughtful. Okay, just think about it. And you, can, you get to choose. You get to decide what, what you eliminate or you don't. You pick for you. But know that the, all of these things are important decisions. Now, how you focus is important too. You can focus on things that you can't change or things that you can. The future, what's coming down the pike, things that I know I can change, or I can focus on things I can't change. That will drive you nutty. Focus on things you can. It's called reframing. I'm not sure what happened to my little circles here, but it's called reframing. And then one last thing I want to mention before I get into kind of a formula for you. The difference between happy people and unhappy people is often gratitude. Now, gratitude is another word that's gotten beaten to death. Okay, it's gotten beaten to death, but think about it. If you're, if I, 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 when I get up in the morning, I think, man, you know, I don't have any pain in my body anywhere right now, and there are so many people out there who do, that, I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful that I'm not somebody who has a chronic pain condition. I'm grateful that I can get up and I can walk without even thinking about it. You know, I'm, I'm grateful. I can take a gigantic deep breath as my, with my breathing exercises, and it's easy, and I don't cough, and I don't feel short of breath, and if, even tiny things like that help keep you oriented in the idea of gratitude. And if you want to do one thing that is phenomenally good for you and for someone else, write a gratitude letter. Find someone in your life that made a big difference to you. I wrote one to my third grade teacher. Find somebody who made a big difference in your life, find, Google where they live, and send them a letter out of the blue. They get a letter saying, thank you for being my third grade teacher who instilled in me an incredible curiosity for the world and taught me how to spell and have good grammar. And they get something out of the blue that makes them feel better. So it's actually a really powerful tool to kind of help you get yourself anchored in gratitude. All right, here's my toolbox for you. Um, first things first, please don't, first, so first things first, be kind to yourself. If you are cranky today, you're cranky today. If you are flipping exhausted and you're not going to get out of bed today, that's fine. One day. 
or two, not in a row. Be kind to yourself, though. Be kind. That's key. You're, you are doing the best you can any day. Remember the essentials. So please get good sleep. Please eat well. Please get some exercise, however you do it. I don't care. And, and schedule it if you need to. Give yourself a break if you didn't do it today. That's all fine. And I will tell you the one thing if you want to get better sleep, put the phone down. It, if it's at your bedside, you're going to pick it up 25 times. You do. If you're reading it like this and you don't have your little your yellow filter on, your brain thinks it's daytime. It's telling your brain, it's telling your pineal gland it's brain, it's daytime. Get rid of that thing. If you can, put it where you can't reach it. If you use it for an alarm, good. Put it where you can't reach it. So when it's an alarm, it actually gets you out of bed to turn it off. You don't hit, you know, reset five times. So get out of it. So please, this is really hard on your sleep. It's what's killing kids. It's basically what's driving teenagers out of their minds. So stop. Remember the little things, so remember things like smiling, so little things, the things like going outside if you need to, get outside, it's helpful, laughing. So we have a, um, if I work a shift at Harvard when I used to work there a lot, and we would basically pull up YouTube videos of things that made me laugh. You know, the kitten videos, the puppy videos. My favorite is Google laughing quintuplets, quint no, laughing qu quadruplets, laughing quadruplets. Four nine-month-old babies, mom with arms around, dad out here taking the video, making all of them laugh at the same time. If that doesn't make you laugh, you really need to go see somebody. Because that is the funniest flipping video, and it makes me laugh every single time. Find something that makes you laugh. Move, get up and dance, move, jump up and down, whatever you need to do. Go into the bathroom at work, close the door, lock it, and rock out. Get yourself moving. It changes your mood completely. Think about reframing. If, you're, if you know you're going to the dark place, then undo the dark place. You can consider this as a technique called stop you can try. Use your senses if you can. Smell things that make you feel better. Listen to music you know makes you feel better. And get outside yourself a little bit sometimes. It helps to just thank somebody else. Make somebody else smile. It's amazing. It makes you offer a compliment. Boy, thank you so much for working. I know this is a really hard situation during COVID. Thanks for being here at the grocery store. I appreciate you being here. Wow, it's just really, really helpful. And then remember to breathe. Now breathe, it turns out your lungs, there's lots of techniques that you can look up here, but the, your lungs are a very good way to calm yourself down. You stimulate your vagus nerve with, with big, gigantic breathing. You slow your heart rate down with big, gigantic breathing. So consider that, that works beautifully as well. So here's my recipe. Learn how to take a body inventory. So if you're feeling stressed, find the places. That's your body saying, dude, you need to chill. Get enough sleep, however you need to do that. Um, exercise if you can anything. So just take the stairs instead of the, es the elevator and you're good to go. Learn something that works for you to relax you quickly. Smelling something, listening to music, outside, deep breathing, whatever makes you quickly. I highly recommend limiting the news. There's nothing good in the news right now. Absolutely nothing. If it's important, you'll find out from somebody else. Limit your doom scrolling. Don't go down the rabbit holes in your phone. And we do it all the time. Click on this, click on this, click on Suddenly you're way over here. When you started here, get rid of the doom scrolling. Try to be empathetic, hard, but try it. Sometimes it's help, very helpful, and being grateful is very helpful. And this loving kindness, consider if you want to. Again, up to you. Any of these that work for you is fine. Um, and then I highly recommend scheduling some. Okay, you pay your bills every, every month because you don't want to get your you know, electricity cut off. Pay yourself. You can pay yourself with some exercise and some sleep. This is a, a slide I just like because it helps me remember, especially during times of COVID, what I can focus on and control and what I can't. So I don't get crazy on the why aren't enough people vaccinated place. And I try to get back into the, you know, I, all I can do is be glad my, the people I love are and I can keep them safe. So don't try to keep yourself in the places that you can make a difference. And then one last thought, and I'm you know, three minutes over, I apologize. I just hope this was helpful. But one last thought I want to mention. One of the things that keeps people going, especially people in what we do, is a sense of purpose. Remember that even if it seems like at work it's impossible sometimes, it's just imp I cannot do this one more time. That sense of purpose is what got you there. You love what you do. Taking care of someone is the most blessed event you can do. It's an incredible thing. Keep that sense of purpose and if you've lost that sense of purpose, find a new one. Find something else that makes you feel like you have a sense of purpose. And so you can do something like you can vote, you can donate your time, you can donate money, you can, you can protest if you need to, you can be a mentor to somebody, you, whatever you can do, lead, do something that gives you a sense of purpose. And then the last thing I want you to know is this is a book I have on my bedside. I have it on my Kindle, I have it on my, I, so I have it with me all the time. This is a book that was written as a PhD thesis by a gentleman who basically went and asked people over the age of 65 a series of questions and said, what would you tell your younger self about this marriage, about worrying about this? What would you tell your younger self? And this is the bottom line on what these beautiful, incredibly eloquent elderly people said. 
They said, free your heart from hatred. Be grateful. Don't waste time worrying. Live simply. Give more and expect less. You are not required to set yourself on fire to keep others warm. I wish you well.